So, I just finished rereading Josiah Bancroft's Books of Babel series, and part of the reason why I reread it in the first place, apart from my own enjoyment, is that I have the mental capacity of a goldfish, so with the last few books coming out years apart from each other, I felt like I forgot key details from previous books. While there are summaries out there for the first two books, and I read a page that I recommend checking out, there's no wiki or that many video series covering the series in full. Now, I would love it if there were video essays that go over the deeper themes and ideas from the series, and I wish I could provide that for you, but again, mental capacity of a goldfish. But I think I can help anyone that wants a quick recap from each of the books. So in addition to Senlin Ascends, I plan on releasing recaps for the other three books, as well as some bonus videos for you and also myself to have as a reference as you read through the series. With that said, let's cover the first book, Senlin Ascends. We start with Thomas Senlin and his wife Maria arriving via train at the Tower of Babel for their honeymoon. They're from a small fishing village called Isaw, where Senlin is a school teacher and Maria is a talented pianist, and also a former student of Senlin's, and yes, while their relationship started sometime after she returned from university, it's still a bit weird. The Tower of Babel is highly regarded for its contributions to art, sciences, and culture, and Senlin has extensively studied the tower. He even brought a book called The Everyman's Guide to the Tower of Babel to help navigate through it. However, in the markets outside of the tower, Senlin is immediately overwhelmed with the crowds and the sheer size of the tower. Mario goes into a woman's clothing store, telling Senlin that if they're separated, they'll meet at the top of the tower. And you can't joke about that and not immediately go missing, which she does. Senlin spends around two days in the markets looking for her until he suspects that Mario went to the third level or ring above the tower called the Baths, where they originally were going to stay. He then meets and hires a savvy stranger named Adam Boreas to be his guide through the tower. They find accommodations in the first ringdom called the basement to get some sleep, but Senlin wakes up to find that Adam stole his luggage and left. With money still in his shoe, he goes to buy a new suit and sees a man, Finn Goal, trying to sell Mario's clothes. Gold claims that he didn't know the clothes were stolen when he bought them, but taking pity on him, Gold takes Senlin on a carousel called the Beer Me Go Round, where riders power it through pedaling and are then rewarded with free beer dispensed into a trough. And guys, that's actually where the book ends, or at least where all books should end, free beer forever. Gold tells Senlin not to trust anyone in the tower or tell anyone that he's looking for his wife, or he'll get taken advantage of. Senlin leaves Gold and waits in line to enter the second ringdom called the Parlor. Someone in line explains that the parlor is an immersive theater experience where guests pay for a role to play for an entire week. Senlin is cast as a butler in a play about an affair between a businessman's wife and his protege. He's also given a list of rules to follow, including a rule that all the fireplaces must remain lit, which Senlin, being the rule following nerd that he is, follows diligently. Within minutes of the play starting, however, a drunken actor playing the businessman actually murders the actor playing his protege in a fit of rage. He then chases Senlin and Edith Winters, the actress playing his wife, throughout their fake home. Senlin and Edith had to work together to escape the set, and as they enter the backstage, the actor is shot by a guard. The two are then put in a cage hanging outside of the tower while their fate is decided. Edith tells Senlin her background, explaining that she was once a farmer, who was pressured into marriage to obtain her father's land, but was then pressured by her husband to stop field work. So she tried to divorce him, and when he refused, she took his money and went to the tower. After a night in the cage, one of the workers reveals the outcome of their case. Senlin will be sent to the baths, while Edith will be branded on the arm and banished to the basement, because unlike Senlin, she did not keep the fires lit. Senlin accompanies her to the branding, then is taken to the entrance to the baths, where it's indirectly revealed that everyone behind the scenes is also an actor. I told you we should have stopped at the free beer, but moving on. The baths, unlike the first two ringdoms, looks like an actual tourist destination. It's got hotels, pools, spas, and Senlin falls into a rhythm here. He checks hotels for Mario during the day, and drinks at a cafe during the night with longtime tourist John Teru. Eventually, however, Senlin's funds start to dwindle. And he learns that the commissioner of the baths, Emmanuel Pound, forces indebted tourists into slavery. Those slaves, who are referred to as Hods, are then sent to serve throughout the tower. Senlin also sees an execution carried out by the commissioner's enforcer, the Red Hand, whose veins glow with a mysterious red fluid. At the cafe, Teru drunkenly harasses an artist and knocks over his paintings as he leaves. Senlin helps the artist named Philip Ogier, and he sees that Maria is the subject of one of his paintings. Ogier offers to give Senlin information on his wife, but only if Senlin does a job for him. He wants Senlin to steal a painting from Commissioner Pound, who he said stole the painting from him. Senlin agrees and convinces Teru, who is familiar with Commissioner Pound, to introduce them at the Commissioner's next gathering. 
And with that, we've got the perfect high screw. A cowardly school teacher and a drunken tourist from the resort bar. At the commissioner's party, Semlin poses as an art critic and feigns an allergy to Ogier's painting, claiming there to be perfume infused into the painting. Commissioner Pound, who is highly allergic to the extent of wearing a gas mask, allows Semlin to decontaminate the painting under supervision of a guard in his solarium. Semlin spends the next few days scoping out the solarium, then sneaks in a copy of the painting by disguising it as a wine wrapper. He gets the guard drunk, then swaps out the paintings while the guard is asleep. The guard then reveals that he knew Sunlin would steal the painting all along, and takes a bribe from Sunlin to give him a head start. On the way back to Ogier, Sunlin runs into Commissioner Pound sentencing Taru into slavery, due to his debts. Taru acts like he never liked Sunlin in order to protect him, and Sunlin returns the painting to Ogier. In exchange, Ogier tells him that Maria offered to pose for him for money. She used that money to hire an investigator to find Senlin, but that investigator was actually what's called a wife monger who sold her to a powerful figure named the Count. The Count is associated with an influential family called the Pels, who reside in the tower's fifth ringdom called Pelfia. Ogier helps Senlin escape on a ferry to the fourth ringdom, New Babel, then gives Senlin his painting of Maria and a gun disguised as a key, and sends him on his way. In New Babel, Senlin's name is immediately recognized by a huge Amazonian woman named Iron. She chases him, catches him, and takes him to her boss, Finn Gol. Gol owns several businesses in New Babel, including a venue called the Steam Pipe and the Port of Gol. Gol and Adam go down to the basement to scout new recruits for the port, which is why Senlin came across them and fell for their con. He offers Senlin the role of portmaster, as he's proved his resourcefulness by making it to the fourth ringdom. Senlin, having no money left, begrudgingly accepts. Adam, now sporting an eye patch, serves as Senlin's second in command. Adam reveals that he first came to the tower with his sister Valletta to find work. He went into debt in the parlor where he thought he was working as a clerk instead of paying to be an actor. So Valletta convinces Finn Gold to rescue Adam, and he then works for Gold to pay off his debt. Valletta, meanwhile, works as an acrobat at the steam pipe, where Adam pays off her boss Rodian from selling her as a prostitute. After Adam robbed Senlin, he boarded a ferry that was taken over by pirates, who robbed him and dropped him off at the parlor, where his eye was gouged as punishment for returning. As portmaster, Senlin improves the port's efficiency and increases its profits. He wins over the workers by increasing their wages behind Gold's back and reading their mail for them since most of them are illiterate. He does this with the intention of assembling a crew, stealing a ship, and escaping New Babel. He also learns that Commissioner Pound had discovered his whereabouts and sends the Red Hand to find Ogier's painting and kill Senlin. Adam and Senlin shoot at the Red Hand to chase him off, and Senlin notices that Ogier hid the painting that Senlin stole within the frame of Mario's painting. In response to the ambush, Senlin has Iron teach him self-defense, and in return, he teaches her how to read. However, Gol learns about this agreement and has Iron beat Senlin as punishment. Later, we get yet another reunion in New Babel, Edith Winters. A lot has changed since we last saw Edith. She lost her arm due to infection, got it replaced with a mechanical one, and now she's first mate aboard an airship called the Stone Cloud. Senlin and Edith catch up, and he unveils his escape plan to her. Senlin will ask her captain, Billy Lee, to smuggle out Ogier's painting out of New Babel. Adam will tip off Rodian that Senlin is trying to smuggle out a painting stolen from Commissioner Pound, which Rodian will try to seize from Senlin. Adam will then tip off Gold that Rodian intends to ambush his port. Senlin will allow Rodian to seize the decoy box that's rigged to explode with a hallucinogenic drug called Crumb. Then, while Gold confronts Rodian, Senlin and crew will escape the port on the Stone Cloud. Edith is not confident in the plan at all, because frankly it's insane, but like everyone, her life is so miserable in the tower that she's like, why not? Later, Billy Lee agrees to smuggle out the painting, however, as the plan's set in motion, Iron forces Senlin to go with her to Gol's house. Senlin believes Gol was going to kill him for any number of reasons, and tries to convince Iron to join his crew. He also explains that the tower uses the physical labor of its unwitting inhabitants to generate power as an engine, with the beer meager rounds pumping the water, then the parlor heating the water with its fires, which rises through the baths to create lightning that shoots out of New Babel, and insists that she doesn't have to contribute to the suffering the tower causes. Iron refuses Senlin's offer. When they arrive, Gold chastises Senlin for increasing the workers' wages behind his back. Senlin considers killing Gold with Ogier's key gun, but decides against it with Gold's wife and children in the home. Gold lets Senlin go, and orders him and Iron to prepare the workers for Rodian's ambush on the port which means that Gol fell for Senlin's plot. Senlin is accosted by Billy Lee upon his return, as he becomes suspicious of Senlin's background. Rodian, alongside Adam, Valletta, and his henchmen, storm the port and seize the decoy box. Rodian shoots Billy Lee, which causes a battle between the crew of the Stone Cloud and his men. 
Edith and Rhodey in duo aboard the Stone Cloud, but Rhodey cuts a cable from the ship, tilting it and causing her to fall off. Gol and his men then arrive to interrupt the fight, but Adam stops everyone to warn them that he tipped off Commissioner Pound about Senlin's whereabouts, and that he's coming to attack the port. Gol orders Iron to seize the box to give to the Commissioner, prompting Rhodey to try to shoot Iron, but Senlin shoots him first with his key gun. Commissioner Pound's warship, the Ararat, arrives and opens fire onto the port. Senlin tells Adam to get the Stone Cloud ready for departure while he gets Iron, which Adam protests. Senlin, who's just about done with Adam's nonsense right now, basically tells him to shut up and do what he's told, which he does. Commissioner Pound disembarks with his men, including the Red Hand, who fights and knocks out Iron. Commissioner Pound reveals that Ogier was a fraud, and the painting that Senlin stole was over a hundred years old. He orders the Red Hand to open the box, triggering the explosion of Crumb. With everyone hallucinating, Senlin and Commissioner Pound duel, but the ropes tying the Ararat to the port are cut, forcing him to flee back onto his ship. Edith returns to fight the Red Hand, and easily overpowers him with her mechanical arm. As she holds him over the edge of the port, he warns her that killing him will displease the Sphinx. She's conflicted by this, but ultimately drops him anyway. Senlin, Edith, Adam, Valletta, and Iron then board the Stone Cloud and escape the Port of Gold. Later, Senlin assesses his new crew, while a hallucination of his wife stands at his side. So, obviously, I really like Senlin Ascents. I like the characters, the setting, and the story itself, and I think each of them complement each other quite nicely. As Senlin travels from Ringdom to Ringdom, it allows for the story to take on different genres and still maintain a consistent tone because each Ringdom is supposed to be distinctive from the last. You get a slasher-like horror scene in the parlor, an art heist in the baths, and a prison-like escape in New Babel, and yet the story still feels cohesive. It's also a lot of fun to see how characters reappear throughout the tower. I love how Finn Gol and Adam's return in New Babel recontextualizes their first meeting with Senlin in the basement, and how Edith's return alludes to a larger mystery and mysticism within the tower. The tower itself is such a well-utilized setting that it almost feels like a character. Not only is it corrosive and indifferent, but it's also the perfect foil for Thomas Senlin, who's idealistic to the point of naivete. He's an unconventional protagonist because he's not heroic by any means, but he does try to uphold his ideals against the harsh reality of the tower, and he often fails, which is very relatable. In the end, yes, Senlin is humbled and hardened by the tower, resulting in him being more pragmatic, but he still maintains his idealism enough to fight for his freedom and his friend's freedom. It's his understanding of the tower and himself that allows him to have any impact on his situation. Are there nitpicks that you can make? Sure. The pacing might drag a bit after the parlor, and there's some plot conveniences that allow Senlin to get out of a few sticky situations. But in my opinion, the plot does need to slow down in the baths to set up the finale and demonstrate the sin of sloth that Senlin experiences there. And I myself found the absurdity of Senlin's luck quite enjoyable. So I'm kind of reaching here because I really didn't take any issue with these. Overall, Senlin Ascends is a sprawling first entry in the Books of Babel series, with witty prose, engaging characters, and one of the most unique settings I've ever read in a book. That about wraps it up for this video. Thank you for watching, I hope you found it useful, and if you're interested, keep an eye out for my next video where we cover the next installment, Arm of the Sphinx.